Last week, Motorsport's greatest voice sadly was taken away from us. Welcome back to Motorsport 101. Hey guys, Dre Harrison here, your host of Motorsport 101. Welcome to episode 292 and uh, what we call season preview season here on Motorsport 101. It's one of our favourite times of the year. We get excited, or at least try to get excited, about Motorsport starting up again. Our mainstream series all starting up a little bit later than planned this year, uh, late March, early April. Um, but uh, sadly, we have to start the show on a pretty sombre note. We'll get into the exact reasons why very very briefly but i'll bring in the host first and foremost to say hi rj o'connell as always hello sir well i always said anything happens in grand prix racing and it usually does um mm. we're we're going to talk about that in a bit it is formula one season preview season uh on the podcast one of our favorite times of the year we'll get there and trust me we'll be lighter hearted in about 20 minutes time i promise king hello sir how's it going man hello uh i'm just i'm just segue out of this for a bit brief joke <laughs> just so everyone's clear this is in fact this better not be out of pocket king it's not out of pocket it is about the america's cup and i'm upset i'm upset that Luna Rosa choked it. Now, why are you upset, it. King? Luna Rosa oh, choked King, it. <laughs> King, like so many of the faithful, put his faith in the factory Italian team, and they just, they, they, they crumpled up that opportunity to win, yelled at the top of their lungs, Kobe, and they went right <laughs> in that trash can. Yeah, they, they, oh. they botched race strategy twice, and those are two wins that probably would have meant we would have had a an even series right now, but no, they choked it. King, we're not yet to the Formula One preview. We've got to stop <laughs> talking about Ferrari botching race strategy. Oh, also, please. congrats on the, the way they con- were looking in preseason. They're not even going to get a chance to botch a race win. Yo, yo, congratulations, King, on them Fauci Ouchy. Yep, thank you. <laughs> hey. Uh, I was gonna. I was gonna say, like uh, having faith in the factory Italian team, not normally a good idea in, in most veins of sport that we follow. The America's yeah. Cup, sadly, no exception. Uh, and finally, also sporting the green today, Cam Buckley. Can, King, King, did you not get the memo? Um, <laughs> <laughs> King, no. King, you are now banned from. You're banned from the corned beef and the booze. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, hello everyone, uh, you know, I just, I just wanted to record a nice F1 season preview with my friends, and much like 2020, 2021 is being a uh, right old bitch with it. It's making, it's, it's making it hard, it's, it's, it's embracing yeah. the grind this year, and I don't mean that in any way, shape, or form a good thing. We'll get into the um, obvious reasons why, if you've been watching this. We are recording this on March 17th. Happy St. Patrick's Day to all those that are listening in. Um, the color of green is is not is purely a coincidence, but uh, here we are. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I would have... I, I would have brought a nice tall beer onto the podcast, but uh, I'm supposed to be playing basketball after this recording's over, and man, me playing basketball drunk would just not go well for <laughs> anyone involved. <laughs> so, uh... We try. Better to drink after the fact. We try, we try. And we fail, but we do try. But places you can find us real quick are on youtube.com forward slash motorsport101. Uh, if you're watching us on there already, hi, nice to meet you. Uh, subscribe, hit the bell if you like already, leave a like and all of that good stuff, and you can get notifications when our next videos go live. There'll be a lot of those in the next couple of weeks coming from yours truly, because I'm going team by team and reviewing the uh, all the Formula 1 teams for 2021 as we speak, the time of recording, I'm already just over a further away through the paddock now. Um, next one up will be Alpine and Ferrari, and that'll probably be out on March 18th. So if you listen to us live on the Discord server, good news, you're getting a video tomorrow. By the time this goes up, there's 
probably a good chunk of the grid already done. But uh, I hope you guys have been enjoying that. In the meantime, we're on facebook.com forward slash motorsport101. We're on Twitter uh, at uh, motorsport underscore 101. Our handles are on the screen as well if you're watching us on YouTube. If you're not, um, we are uh, at Harrison101HD, at RJ O'Connell, at Ryan Eric King, and at C Buckley 917 um, If you really, really like us, you can back us financially as well on Patreon. Patreon.com forward slash motorsport101. Uh, five bucks gets you early access to all of our audio content, ten bucks for the video version, and access to the supporters club of our Discord server where you can listen to these episodes live as they're being recorded. Shout out to the chat. As always, we've got Finley, Jason, we've got our man Lewis. Congrats on the after the flag gig, buddy. Great job as as we all thought yeah. we were gonna do. Made it look way too goddamn easy. Uh, Sasha and Zoe in here as well. I hope you guys enjoyed the show tonight. Um, and uh, yeah, um, all the details of that and much, much more will be on our website, motorsport101.com. Now, the new section was always going to be kind of a brief one, um, given we're going to kind of intersperse testing, obviously, with some of our season previews anyway. But sadly, in the last week, not one, but... Uh, we lost two very important figures in the world of motorsport in this past week. One of them, sadly, this morning uh, the, yeah. on the day of recording, which is just doubly sad. But uh, both yeah. equally important in their own way. Um, we have to talk about the tragic loss of Samari Walker. Um, and yeah. Uh, yeah, RJ, you can lead us off on that. Yeah. Um, Murray Walker lived to be 97 years old. He passed away on March 13th. Um, survived by his wife of 55 years, Elizabeth. Um, I think what stands out to me about Murray Walker is the joy and the enthusiasm that he brought to Formula One as a commentator, uh, or, or just a commentator of any sport, because Murray Walker's broadcasting career spanned seven decades. Did you know that he was a radio announcer for a for a pre for the 1949 British Grand Prix, which means he was calling races on radio before there was a Formula One World Championship. And his last commentary gig was on BBC Radio in 2007. Yeah. Of course, many will know that he was the voice of Formula One in the United Kingdom for BBC from, I want to say, 78 to, uh, to 1996, and then picked it back up with ITV from 97, from 97 to 2001. Um, I, as an American... Didn't get a chance to grow up with Murray Walker on commentary. At least, we still have him video games. Um, Murray, of course, very famous for his work in Formula One. Also did touring cars, motorcycle racing. That was the thing he did before he really got big at F1. He was, him and his father uh, called motorcycle races. In fact, uh, both, of them, cr- both of them did motorcycle races and yeah. uh, were reasonably successful with it. I I think Murray Walker was one of the greatest voices in all of sport. Not just motor racing by itself, but in all of sport. Like on the stature of someone like a like a Vince Scully was to prof- to is to professional baseball, for instance. Uh that's uh like Murray Walker is one of the greatest voices in sport. You know, we talk about his energy. I know a lot of people will rightfully point out that, like, even when Murray flubbed his lines, even when he had a gaffe on commentary, one of his famous Murrayisms, and especially later in his career when this became more common, I don't think I knew of anybody that could be remembered warmly for flubbing their lines on commentary whenever they did. I think it's something fun to relate to where... You get so enthusiastic about the sport that you're watching that you forget how to speak properly. And that's just the thing, because that yeah. you kind of forget that, like, when it, when Murray was on his game, nobody could paint a picture no. of a scene that's playing out in motor racing better than he was. Nobody brought the level of enthusiasm. Every aspiring broadcaster in motorsport wanted to, wanted to be like him in their own way. But he was a one one of one kind of person. And, you know, he had, you know, he's some of his most famous calls, whether it's Mansell blowing a tire in Adelaide in 86, Prost and Senna's two run-ins, Damon Hill winning the championship in 1996. And I have to stop now because I have a lump in my throat. The list goes on and on. 
He always found the right level of emotion for every moment. He could be critical of F1 too and its competitors, but in the moment called for it, but he was never he was never unfair. He usually left that to his color guys. And he had so much joy for his job that he could make he could make a dull race seem entertaining and he make an entertaining race seem like one of the greatest moments in all of sport. Um Murray lived to have a fantastic long life and I think everyone will remember him long after he's passed because he left behind so, so many happy memories for anybody who listened to him, whether he's calling races on television or radio or even just having a bit of fun, like calling a game of snooker with, with Jeremy Clarkson or <laughs> doing a pizza hut commercial with Damon, uh, like Damon Hill. Like uh, it's, it's sad. And, he lived a long time, and I guess many people might have might have known that, like, hey, you know, you, you have to cherish when somebody like that is here with us because um, because they may not have long on this earth. And Murray was with us for a long time, and he will certainly be missed, as will somebody that we lost just this morning, Shabine, Sabina Schmitz, the queen of the Nürburgring. She battled cancer for four years, and we lost her this morning at the age of 51. I think most of us will probably know uh, Sabina as a as a presenter and a guest on BBC's Top Gear. Um, but before that, she was an incredibly accomplished racing driver, one of the very best, one of the very best women drivers that we've ever seen by way of winning the 24 hours of the Nürburgring, not just once, but twice in a row, driving a BMW M3, um, and then later on in her career, she co-founded the Frickadelli Racing Team, who have been part of the Nürburgring 24 hours ever since. And she nearly won the race a third time. She finished third or overall with Frickadelli back in 2008, um, which, of course, all of her reputation as a Norse Life Specialist. She was one of the ring taxi drivers where you could just pay a few bucks, ride around with a professional racing driver, and get to drive around the green hell at full speed. Uh, and that led to her appearances on Top Gear and even for a brief time being a honest-to-goodness co-presenter of the show during that brief turnover between the Clarkson and the Harris years. Um, and Dre, certainly you you know you know a lot about uh, Sabina's appearances on, on Top Gear, which were very, very entertaining. Oh, season five um, was when we first saw her um, back in the early days of the show, back when they were still... Uh, there was still a lot of of car journalism at its core, and I rewatched it this afternoon for obvious reasons. And it was the <clears throat> it was the infamous challenge where Jeremy Clarkson has to drive a diesel powered uh, new Jaguar X Type round the Nurburgring in under ten minutes, and like the Jeremy's coach was Sabine, and and she was sarcastic, funny, brave. You know, you, 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 again, I've said it so many times, motorsport is such a male-dominated world, and it will be for for a long, long time. And then you see, you, and this is the first time I'd ever seen her, and there's this woman that's going around here in a diesel jag, and she's kicking the asses of everyone that's going around, overtaking Porsches, overtaking dudes on superbikes, overtaking people in M3s, and... It was mind blowing to to watch that, and this this was when I was God, I think thirteen years old when it first aired. Um, she is an incredibly important figure when it comes to women in motorsport in the twenty first century because the amount of people, the amount of tributes that I saw um, on Twitter from women who are fans of the sport saying that the first time they could see or envision maybe them being in that same industry down the road was seeing Sabine on Top Gear. Not maybe if it wasn't the first time, it was certainly the second time when she had that iconic line, the iconic follow up, where it was like, I could beat that lap time in a van. Uh, <laughs> and she very nearly did a few years later when Richard Hammond was there for, again, her second appearance on the show. And there's even a fantastic and very um, unfortunate joke at the end of her first appearance where. You know, again, as Lewis points out in our Discord chat, the first time that Sabine took, took the Jaguar around the lap, she did it 47 seconds faster than Clarkson did. 9 minutes and 12 seconds. And then when Clarkson's getting the piss taken out of him in the studio, he turns around and says, 
Um, well, she's so fast, we're thinking about giving her your job, which <laughs> actually oh, happened yeah. about a decade later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it, <laughs> came, it came true. Um, it actually did come true in, in, in the mm. mysterious way the world works, but the amount of people that were introduced to her via Top Gear will be priceless. Like, given it's one of the most watched TV shows in history, certainly in modern television, given it's on the world service and given it's in so many countries around the world, so many influence, so many inspired shows down the road. It was one of its most important appearances, not that we knew it at the time. Um, but, yeah, it, it was it was TV gold. I've said it before. If you haven't seen it, Season 5, Episode 5, go find it. It is, um, I've, I've still said this as a Top Gear hard nut fan who's watched all 30 series. It's one of the show's finest moments. The emotion of Clarkson finally doing it in the end is one of those things where it's 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 fantastic television. And it wouldn't be possible if it wasn't for Sabine. She's got a little footnote in that show's history and it's priceless. Not to diminish anything else she's done in a real life yeah. racing car, but in terms of modern pop culture, it, it, it's it's incredible. No, it's, it's, where, it's where she's very recognizable. Mm. And, uh, of course. I mean, the motorsport world lost two giants in this last yeah. week. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, what 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 more can be said? Uh, one of one's true originals. People who will, while they may be gone, they their names live on for eternity. Absolutely, yeah. um, so, Dre. Um, mm. Some if you if you have some thoughts about because you're the because of all this us being stateside again, hmm. we did. We, we only got it really in video games. Yeah, yeah, but, I guess. Yeah, uh, just, I. Just yeah, some thoughts I mean, on Marie Walker to close things out. Um, it, I, I've, I, I did a few words on Instagram last week, um, but I've, I've done some thinking, and it's another one of my favorite broadcasters who gave me a quote that stuck with me about a, a decade ago, and it was, um, you may know him from combat sports, it's Mauro Ranallo. Um, from the WWE and from his time when he commentated in Pride um, in mixed martial arts as well, where he said, we as commentators are soundtracks to the fight, obviously referring to himself and obviously what he was doing at the time, but I think that's synonymous with any sport. And when you think of great moments in sport, you often think of the great commentary and the calls that are made alongside it. We, how many times have we joked about in this very Discord about Dale Earnhardt and the 20 years quote that sticks yeah that resonates so way. strongly with his win and it, it, it's the same with us brits and murray walker all, all, like, all of my favorite moments as a young motorsport fan he was the soundtrack and i remember being a young ferrari fan in 2000 at suzuka i'd gotten up at six o'clock in the morning uk time because i thought this could be the one where it was like she might have the best finally is yeah, he like, finally put it together this year. Yeah, we grew up a house of Ferrari fans. It was like, my first poster on the wall was a Ferrari 550 Maranello. So, you know, we were all Ferrari fans. Dad woke me up at 6 a.m. You watch it, and then you know, Schumacher came out on top, and he finally won that third title, and the first for Ferrari in goodness knows how many years. And, you know... Do you, I even remember, was it, I remember Maurice call and I remember, and it was an, just an addition to that moment because he knew how important Schumacher was to F1. He was the guy, even when he wasn't winning, he was the guy. And that's no disrespect to Mick Ackerman or anybody else in the sport, but he had become an integral part of what we knew F1 to be in the early 21st century. And he was there. I remember Dad spoke for years about Damon Hill in '96, the lump in the throat quote. The, you know. Jack Villeneuve and Schumacher when they tangled at Jerez in 97. You know, there's so many little moments that Murray Walker made better for his presence. And that is the biggest endorsement I think you can have of any broadcaster or any commentator. Like, a great soundtrack is so important. And Murray was that soundtrack. He, he had just this unending, undying enthusiasm and love for this sport. For motorsport in general, something that oh, the way he, like drops there. So, something that we I, wish I, we could have. I, I love the way he put it in an interview in 2013 that it was never work for him. 
Murray did it because he absolutely loved the sport, the people in it, and every moment he spent as part of it. Yeah, and you, you could tell every time he picked up a microphone, this was never work. He did it because he genuinely loved what he did. And that love and that passion came through in every broadcast he did. And if, if we can live our lives personally to 10% of the love and enthusiasm that Murray had for his passion, which was motorsport, I think we've done all right in life. And look, I, I try to be... I, I, I'm not really the most somber person in the world. People that know me on this Discord know I'm, I'm the, the first guy to crack jokes, the first guy to, you know, try and crack a smile and pick everybody else up a little bit. And I, I want to... I, if anything, I want to celebrate his life because I wouldn't be the most sport fan I am today if it wasn't for him. And 97, as we cricket fans say, is a great innings, no, regardless of of you know however it ended you know and he he was he's a wonderful broadcaster a wonderful human being what a life he had i know uh, if he Let's brings see, out he there lived, there's a <laughs> he, he lived to 97 and yet it feels like he lived a life 10 times that yeah it's crazy Absolutely. it is crazy he's got a fantastic documentary the bbc made about him from a few years ago it's 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 front page on the iplayer right now for you brick listeners out there i highly recommend it if you haven't already um check it out on bbc iplayer i think it, i think it was rebroadcast a couple of days ago so check your sky boxes as well if you're if you're that way inclined um but yeah as, as rj alluded to it's a it's it's him and Vin Scully, I think, are the two most in- in- incredible sports broadcasters ever. It's a club of two, as far as I'm concerned, and he is the voice of Formula One, and he, f- he will forever be the voice of Formula One. As- and that's no disrespect to anyone else who's picked up a mic before or after, but when I think of motorsport, I think of Murray Walker, and I- I'm sure that will go for a lot of people. <sighs> Should we should we should we review 2021 guys? Should we preview that? Would that, would that, would, would that lighten the mood a bit? I think, uh, yeah, a little <laughs> bit of a mood change is necessary. Yeah. All right. <sighs> so I got us organized. Uh, the first thing I did was I asked the Motorsport 101 community uh, on Discord. I asked our supporters um, where they think all ten constructors will finish. I put out a poll. Fifteen people voted in the poll. Some of us did, some of our community did, and how that poll turned out is the order in which we'll start talking about these teams from the from what the community believes will be the 10th best team in Formula 1 out of 10, and the best team out of Formula 1 out of 10. And I've got to say, y'all are very certain about the top and the bottom of the World Constructors Championship table. <laughs> Everything else... Could be a bit back. Who knows? Yeah, I think I think it was said pretty well during testing. There is no midfield anymore. It's just the field, and then theoretically the two teams out in front. <laughs> and then theoretically the two teams at the bottom. Uh, so Maybe. the community voted, and also after we talk about every team, we'll have some prop bets, predictions, uh, championship odds for entertainment purposes only. Um, so the community voted. And the team that you think is going to finish bottom of the barrel is your old Cali Haas F1 team with Haas VF21 Ferrari and a all rookie lineup of Mick Schumacher and Nikita Mazepin. Schumacher from Germany is the 22 year old Formula 2 champion, winner of two races, 10 podiums, three fast laps, 20 top 10 finishes, 24 races. And of course, he is the FIA European Formula 3 champion. Nikita Mazepin is a neutral athlete from Russia, 22 years of age, credibly accused of sexual assault in a video circulated on Instagram and other forms of social media. Oh, and he was also fifth in the 2020 Formula 2 Championship with two wins, two fast slaps, six podiums, 17 points paying finishes in 24 races. And the vibe that I think I got, and King, I'm sure you agree with me, is that... Unless it's Mick <laughs> Schumacher asserting head-to-head dominance, which I'm going to tell you for free, that's my first hot take, is that Schumacher is going to go 23-0 and in head-to-head qualifying. It's not even going to be close. Mm. King, I kind of get the feeling that, like, this is kind of a... This is going to be a weird year for Haas. Yeah, it's going to be a weird year for Haas. Uh, it, it's... The reaction on social media, uh, to be fair, not good for Haas. No, no one likes their team. Nope. 
Uh, no. No, ha- Haas have very quickly fallen from likable new team in F1 <laughs> to fuck these guys on social media hey, Cam, in the space got a of question. a couple years. Yeah, got a question for you, Cam. Uh, what sort of new and groundbreaking features does the VF21 have compared to its predecessor? You see, I want to sit you down, Mr. O'Connell, because you were yelling <laughs> at me for weeks that Ferrari <laughs> isn't going to let this car flounder, that they can't let Mick Schumacher, their prized possession... The heir to the Schumacher dynasty end up in a shit box. Ooh. Well, um, mm. to be fair to Haas, they brought I think a sum total of three new parts. Ooh. Three of them. That, 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 that's compared to last Found year. Them. Not that, that's compared to last year because this car is very clearly an interim car. They've already said they're not going to develop it. It has more or less. The changes required by the new regulations, an undernose cape, and a slightly adjusted front wing. That's yeah, about it. They look slow. Good. Their mileage was eh, okay. Um, they got mileage came, at least. Yeah, um, which is a running theme for all the Ferrari powered teams. And there's just, I don't see anything particularly positive about this team except for the drivers in the seats, and that's certainly to say nothing about their personalities. Mick, whose mm. personality I'm fine with, and Nikita Mazepin, who can go, uh, well. Anyway. <laughs> go go yeah, find a quick way look, to a ditch. <laughs> um, yeah. I don't think... Yeah. The problem for Haas is that on driving talent, realistically, they didn't upgrade on last year because they're both going to need no. to find their feet. The car is... A nothing burger. It's the ultimate nothing burger of a car. Their livery had to be investigated by WADA for <laughs> which, <laughs> circumventing the Russian flag ban. Which, you, know uh, it's bad when you, make, you know it's bad when you make WADA seem like the good guys here. You know, like, yeah. that's, that's never a good sign. Yeah, yeah. Like, now, fair yeah. enough. With screams, they said it's fine. Yeah, you know what mm-hmm. screams, I'm not guilty, as in, hey, we have a backup case of team gear just in case anything happened. <laughs> I was gonna say, get, get the Sharpie pens out and color in all the dark blue black. Um, there's nothing to suggest out of testing that Haas is gonna do anything more than flounder at the back. I mean, we saw it last year that Romain Grosjean and Kevin Magnussen had to dig real goddamn deep to get any points out of that car. Yeah, and, yeah. and that's the other thing I wanted to talk about. I'm sure Dre, you can agree with me on mm. this. It's like, yeah, Roman Grosjean and Kevin Madison have at points in their careers, and Grosjean especially before he almost died in Bahrain mm. uh, yeah. several months ago. They were the butt end of so many jokes. Grosjean can't keep from crashing the car. Magnussen can't keep from crashing his car into other people. But mm. those are two big experience losses that they now have to fill with two rookie drivers. At worst, you could say they were two serviceable drivers who, if the car was good, you knew they could score points on a semi-frequent basis. Their speed uh, obviously- was not the issue. Yeah. No, the, the the big problem last year was probably their reliability. They had 10 DNFs last year, more than any other team in the field. I mean, when 10 out of your 34 cars for the season don't see a checkered flag, that's not a good start. I mean, last um, year, they, they were open about it. Their aero balance was shifting something like 4% from corner to corner, which is cataclysmic in the world of aerodynamics. Um, <laughs> I think... I think... They will genuinely be the worst team this year, yeah, it, and that's it was, not like, to say I'll, anything I'll, about. Uh, no. it's, it's not even going to be the driver's uh, fault. Yeah. Is Discord and, okay? I, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I was going to say Discord um, just shit itself. No, I was going to say everything's fine on mine. I was going to say is that com- the bottom three are in their own category last year because they were talking about the guys that barely scored a point. There's like a 100 point drop off from Alpha Tari to the bottom three from last year, right? Now, at least with Haas, so at least with Williams, I should say, there's some genuinely reasons. There's genuine reasons to be optimistic about the Williams camp going forward, and at least they have a potential ace driver in their hands. We don't know exactly how good he is, but we'll get to that in a minute. Haas. There is almost nothing redeeming about this team right now whatsoever. The car is terrible. It's been PR disaster after PR disaster for their team. They're under-resourced. You know, they, they've got their owners one foot out of the door. And even their likable driver is normally 
a two-year sort of guy where the second exactly. year he seems to really find his foot in. And his rookie years, he's tended to struggle a little bit by comparison. He's a bit of a slow learner, yeah. which doesn't exactly help. No. So, But that's that's always been the thing about okay. Mick Schumacher, is that he hasn't always been all talent. He hasn't been like a raw talent the way that Charles Leclerc was. He has been... You know, somebody who's had to consistently develop, and he's been, he's a bit more of an industrious driver than a lot of Ferrari dr- no, he's, junior he's drivers very, in his past. He's very different. He's very methodical in the way he goes about his work. Uh, they were actually mm. the, the team was talking about the way he conducts himself as a driver, and they like what they see. But as you said, Mick, tu- Mick Schumacher and um, annoyingly enough Nikita Mazepin are talented enough behind the wheel and this year they are not going to have the tools to show that talent in f1 yeah because that that was the point i was about to make where the gap in talent between schumacher and mazepin isn't as large as people on social media would like it to be uh but it's not going to matter because they're going to be at the back of the field anyway yeah Yeah, it doesn't matter how much you beat them because you're both scoring zero (laughs) yeah like it, the further down you go down the field, the more and the more irrelevant your car is, the less the head-to-head matchup stat really matters anyway. Because, I mean, you look at it on paper, Nicholas Latifi would have finished above George Russell in the championship if Sakir had never happened. And we all know that it tells a different story once we actually dig a little bit deeper into that and watch the eye test. So yeah. it becomes less relevant the further down the grid you go anyway, because in terms of points which is the real tiebreaker in the championship, it doesn't really matter. They're both probably going to... It would not surprise me if Haas has a donut for the year. Let's put it to you that I, way. I, I don't no, know if I, that's I, necessar- predict that. I, I don't know if that's necessarily the case, though, because if if Mick Schumacher is clearly, like, the fastest guy, but Mazepin flukes at a point in some race where there's, like, 12 DNFs and Schumacher doesn't get anybody, that's not definitively saying that Mazepin's a better driver than Schumacher. Well, no, but that's just the point, is that... Yeah. Yeah. The 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 point margins are so small there that any f- like Robert Kubica was also Robert yeah. Kubica scored a point. George Russell didn't until he got in that Mercedes. Yeah. Jimmy Bruni Kubica. didn't score a point at Minardi. Zolt Baumgartner did. Yeah. Which one's still active in motor Yeah, that, that's yeah. that's you know the same point Drew is trying to make. Where it's like if you're at the back, yeah. head to head matchup doesn't really matter. No, and I think uh, not on points. And, and this is. I think it's a little bit less on the merit of the team, but the problem with Haas right now is w- their model that they came into Formula One with, uh, the, the buy everything you can and then kind of build around it via Delara and Ferrari's mm. wind tunnel. That's good to come into the sport. And of course, they came in, they scored points day one. They had a couple of very, very good years. One year that they arguably should have been best of the rest ahead of They were fourth in the, the championship three. three years ago. Well, they would have been were it not for um, an unfortunate Australia. They would have been. They were, in, they were consistently in that fight. How yes. is it that but this team But the problem is, so is that that system now, it, it doesn't give them any room to correct something if it goes wrong. They lost wind tunnel correlation at the start of 2019. Oh, and yeah. they've never got it back. And with their, with their current um, car production model, if you get into a hole... There's no way out. There's no fast way out because you're relying on outside parties. And Haas is still a very new team. Mm. They don't have the they don't have the methods in place to find a problem, identify it, solve it, and then produce the fix. And for the past two years, that has been on full display. They start the year not so great and they just they just fall. And now they're at rock bottom. There's not really much to say beyond that for this year. 2022, we'll just have to wait and see what happens. Mm. And by then, the whole structure of this team could be very different. Gunther Steiner may not be there. Gene Haas may not be there as a principal owner. I am I am in the full belief that uh, this is the last year that this is, quote, Haas Formula One team. Wouldn't be too surprised. Mm. I think that's Number enough nine. shitting on Haas for a few minutes. Yeah, uh, we've we'll yeah we've on. exceeded we've exceeded the one minute that we wanted to initially talk about Haas uh, <laughs> by, by a mile and a stretch. <laughs> Let's talk about some teams that are actually giving us some optimism for the first time in a couple of years. 
Williams Racing, the Williams FW43B is in Bravo Mercedes with George Russell and Nicholas Latifi returning for their second year. Russell, of course, back for his third season with the team. He led 59 laps, set the fastest lap, and scored his first championship points in Secure in a factory Mercedes stadium for Lewis Hamilton. But he still has an unbeaten 37-0 record while he is at Williams and had to get qualifying. Let's see if he returns for a second season. He scored their best finishes of 2020, 11th places at Monza and Imola, and is, of course, the 2019 Formula 2 uh, runner-up. Russell won that title in 2018. This is the first year under new management of Josh Capito and Simon, Simon Richards of Dorothy Capital. And generally, the vibe that I get, Williams don't look as bad as they did the last couple of years. They look no, um, genuinely they look better. Okay. Yeah. They look okay. Um, obviously, being a B-spec car, everything's a B-spec car this year, but mm. discussion's sake. Um, it's always going to be based on the not-so-great car from last year. Williams is taking a kind of an interesting approach and one that has been kind of thrown around in forums before of, why not just build a car that in certain conditions is great and in others sucks. Because if you're all the way that, if you're that far back anyways, if you get lucky in conditions and score a point because your car's working well, they can't take that point away from you after the fact. Unless um, there's a post-race time penalty, but still. Oh, no. Not uh, those. Um, they looked okay in testing. They did. Uh, Kang, what's your what's your initial reactions feelings, vibes about the brand new Williams, who I gotta say, the new look for the team, pretty divisive, but I like it. It's, it's Somebody asked him. <laughs> it, it's quite generic. Yeah. Though, in terms of performance, you know, the chart that everyone's been, you know, retweeting and sharing around is everyone's times compared to their best lap time last year. Uh, uh, and everyone's down on last year except one C Williams, and it's like it, it it shows it doesn't show how good Williams is now. It mainly shows how bad they were last year. It's yeah, they, they have made progress, which wasn't that hard when the bar was in the inner core of the earth. <laughs> yeah, like Williams are in fact improving, but it's not going to be a night and day change from last year. No. No. I, I think that's the big thing uh, with these two teams here is that these regulations are dead stick for them. They're going to build a car, get try and get what they can out of this year, and put as much resource and personnel as possible into the 2022 cars. We've seen what regulation changes can do to shake up the field. We saw that very graphically with Williams at the start of the turbo hybrid era. Right. <laughs> um... Uh, wouldn't it be wonderful if they could reproduce that? Dre, what does George Russell need to do this season if he's going to play himself into a full-time ride at some other silver and black and maroon red team? Um, stick stick a banana in Bottas' tailpipe? Because um, there's not sure of that. Lot- no, because there's, there's not an awful lot you can do from the seat he's in. Like, no. I, I said it before, like, Sakir was the smoking gun. It was the experiment that a lot of people had wanted to see. And it, he passed that test with flying colours. Um, this Williams what, what car is... What more can he is... do to prove beyond no. being in the Mercedes for one race, not fitting in it, and until his uh, pit stop mishap was manhandling Bottas? No, look, 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 there's nothing more he can do from his seat because his seat is crap. Relatively yep. speaking, it's still probably not going to score an awful lot of points, if any, this year. So he's going to be in for a real hard task. It's it's not about what he can do in that car. It's about what does Toto Wolf want to do with Mercedes in the future. And I'm sure we'll get to that when we get to their section. Spoiler alert, it's probably at the deep end of this preview. Just, just a hunch. But um, <laughs> there's there's not an awful lot more Russell can do. I mean, unless what he goes and scores points on a semi-regular basis. Cause, but people really, really want George to do well. So much so, he was getting into Q2 on a semi-regular basis last year. And everyone was like, oh my god, Russell made Q2. And I'm like, dude, he's done it like seven times this year. This is That's no longer a surprise. 
like, like he's, it's just, it's a good one lap car, and Russell's an excellent qualifier. Like, a certain point, like, there's a law of diminishing returns on something like this. But I know a lot of people are are backing Russell for a top tier seat, and I completely understand why the hype was real. We saw it in Sakir. Is, is this that you know the kid is incredibly impressive? But he's going to have to sit there and bide his time because there's not an awful lot he can do from there. It's going to come down to what his boss's team ends up wanting to do and how they get on more than anything else. At least that's the impression that I get because I don't think Williams are going to be more than ninth. And if they are, I think it's going to be freak points at best. Um, Because again, as, as, as King alluded to, their bar was really goddamn low last year and getting back on pace with... Hass and Alpha would be a reasonable target, let alone points. I think... I think they will end the season with both drivers in the points. At least single digits. I'm not going to go crazy and say they're both going to get double-digit points totals. Score-free podium or something like that. Although that would be cool. I just don't want to... I just don't want to think that Williams can go their first season with a whole new structure and what looks like a genuine plan to turn things around and think that they're still going to suck as bad as they did last year. And also, Nick Lissetti is a nice dude. For, for, a, for a replacement level pay driver, he is certainly an all right dude as far as that goes. I, I think, uh, I kind of echo what Arj, I don't think they're going to, I don't think they're going to score points this year. I think they'll be better than Haas on merit. Um, but then for both of these teams at the bottom, this year isn't the target. Next year has to be the target. And yeah. for George Russell, all he can do is keep doing what he's doing. Yeah. Yeah. If he if he goes 23-0 and and qualifying against Latifi, that's that's pretty much a, at least a third of the job done. Um, in the last team in this uh in this small sits, uh, I've omitted a word there, Alfa Romeo Racing Orland, the C41 Ferrari, Kimi Raikkonen and Antonio Giovinazzi. Kimi Raikkonen's been around forever. He has the most starts of any driver, 332 races, 329 starts, 21 wins, 103 podiums, 46 fast laps, and of course, a world title in 2007. Antonio Giovinazzi has uh, eight points to his name in a mediocre to bad Alfa Romeo, but two interesting stats. Kimi Raikkonen has scored 57 of Alfa Romeo's 65 points since the start of 2019. Antonio Giovinazzi has a head-to-head qualifying record of 500 and also longer hair Um, right hair and this is this team got a lot of attention in testing and i think people called out that what they were doing was low fuel glory runs to get near the top of the board at least see what they could do when the car is turned off all the way to the maximum I don't mm. get the impression that people think that is indicative of Alfa Romeo is going to jump to the top of the midfield. No, no. Uh, nothing to really show evidence of that. Car looked okay. Uh, I believe they tied for most mileage of any team on 422 laps along with uh, said Alfa. 21st for laps. Yeah. Mm. Um, it's Alfa Tauri, I think. Alfa Tauri. Alfa Tauri, mm. right. Mm. Um just feels like they it feels like this team has for the last two years uh they're going to score the occasional point uh Kimi Raikkonen is still very good in his even in his old age Antonio Giovinazzi is a he's there <laughs> he he exists he he certainly is a 2021 formula 1 world championship driver I Great think helmet design. Is we don't, Great the hat. problem for Giovinazzi is once again one that's been brought up here before. If you can't beat a 42 year old Kimi Raikkonen, who Ferrari have already dropped, what use is there to promote you beyond this below mid kind of whatever Sauber team? It seems to me as if. It's, it's, it's weird, because, like, Gio did have one remarkable thing happen to him in 2020. Most positions gained on opening laps. 46 of them. Like, so, like, so he was excellent off the line and not much else. He's um, very, very good wheel-to-wheel, but in terms hmm. of his raw pace, he's just... He's not a Russell or a... So far as we've seen, Tsunoda. 
Yeah, we'll get the, to the, that the, later. The problem is, is that for Alpha, it's a long way up because the next team from them in the championship last year was over a hundred, nearly a hundred points away from them, and that's Alpha Tauri. So to get into that group of where the top seven was, where there was a big, big gap last year between seventh and eighth. They've got to take significant steps forward. They've got to go from an occasional scorer to a frequent scorer and start taking points out of the midfield teams above them. And they were not doing that on a frequent enough basis. They were beating yeah. the teams around them that were also not scoring regularly. So Alfa they, Romeo they, has not been that kind of team since the first half of 2019. It has been a downhill slide ever since. And I but, don't necessarily think it's all the personnel in place because... Frederick Vasseur, who's going to miss the first race because of a positive COVID test, yeah, well, is Fred. rated as one of the best team principals in the paddock. Kimi Raikkonen is a world champion. Antonio Giovinazzi came just a handful of points away from beating Pierre Gasly for a Formula 2 title a, year, a couple of years back. They've never replaced Charles Leclerc. That's the problem. Charles Leclerc is a different level as a driving talent. They've not been able to replace yeah, his presence that, it's, since. It's odd. It's as, as they've gained more investment from Ferrari in the last, uh, since 2019, they've actually gone backwards. Hmm. Which is weird because, which which, which is one, weird, and two, I still get the impression they don't completely want to be a Ferrari B team either because they had a chance to go after their driver academy if they thought the driving talent was the problem in this team, and they elected not to. Um, so... They're happy with their driver lineup, at least, at least they, or at least they give off the impression that they're happy with their driver lineup because they, it never really felt like Raikkonen or Gio was going underwear, or 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 felt like they were at risk for their seats unless you read certain elements of Twitter. Um, yeah, <laughs> give me Callum, um, etc. There's, there's just not much to say about this team. It feels like they're going to be in the the lonely old chasm between the rest of the field, and then the two teams behind them. Mm. Yeah, King, what do you reckon? King's got nothing for this. <laughs> King's like, oh. it, it feels like they're in a no-man's land, where it's like... Exactly. Mm. It's They're not going to get worse, but they're not going to improve. And maybe they're focused on 2022, but it's like, with this lineup, you really think Raikkonen's gonna be around for three years? Like... Kimi Raikkonen is gonna keep doing this until he's bored. <laughs> and he's gonna keep doing it on rolling one-year deals and not checking with his publicist to see if that West Coast Choppers merchandise is gonna be a good look on his face. Oh. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, I, uh, a... I, I, don't, I don't want to follow in a narrative like these these three teams at the back are just going to stay where they are and nothing's going to change or improve. But <sighs> unless those, uh, unless those flying laps and testing are an indicator of something better, I just don't see it. And some of the people that were in the paddock for three days of testing seem to think otherwise. Yeah, I hope they can at least bridge the gap a little. I'm yeah. not asking them to get to, sco- to jump the like fifth in the championship. I'm just saying score double digit points. I think, I think Vic actually he put it pretty well in our, in, our, in our supporters chat in the Discord. Every time Sauber has a big budget, they go backwards. Every time. Hmm. I think the it's last time spot. that they weren't like that were like in like the peak years of BMW Sauber, like oh six to oh eight, mm. and then of course that ended badly. Uh, real badly. Yeah. Indeed. Should we, um, should we get into actual Formula 1 rather than Formula 1.5 down below us now? Let's, let's okay, that's Formula 1.97. <laughs> yeah. We're, we're moving out of LMP3 and we're moving into LMP2 with Scuderia, AlphaTauri, Honda, the constructors formerly known as Minardi, AlphaTauri's new ATO2 Honda, driven by Pierre Gasly and the third of our rookies, Yuki Tsunoda. Gasly, of course, last year's Italian Grand Prix winner... In the 26 races he's had since moving back to this team in Belgium 2019, he has two podiums, including that win and 15 top 10 finishes. He is a GP2 champion and a Super Formula Vice champion. Yuki Tsunoda was third in the Formula 2 championship last year with three wins, four feature race polls, three fastest laps, seven podiums, and 13 points paying finishes in 24 races. Uh, And they seem to make a positive impression in testing. Uh... Are I'm declaring them. 
I'm the class, I'm declaring them testing champions, which is a which is which is which is a real message as to how irrelevant testing actually is in the grand scheme of things. But hey, Dude, I don't even, I don't champions. even know if they're the highest. I don't even know if they're the second high. If they're the highest ranked team owned by Red Bull in the testing championship. <laughs> Look, they I mean, uh, pound for pound. They had a good test. Uh, first of all, Yuki Tsunoda. Kid looks good in an F1 car. Um, don't read too much gonna... into the testing times because, uh, well, he was opening the DRS a little enthusiastically early. I just but, say, uh... um, <laughs> I, I know it's not going to happen this year. I don't expect another Italian Grand Prix like we had last year. Mm. But I get the feeling that Yuki Tsunoda is going to be his country's first Grand Prix winner and first world champion at the rate that he's developing. Yeah, Yuki is... Uh... Bold. I, I honestly I agree with RJ I think Yuki's been phenomenal uh, it's been phenomenal to watch his rise Alpha Tari looked pretty good yep. uh, probably along with the Aston Martin probably the most changed car on the year um, new nose new front suspension uh, a little bit more of a Red Bull clone than it was last year and they led mileage uh, out of all the teams jointly with Alfa Romeo, the Battle of the Alphas. Sorry to cut you there, Cam, for a second. Are we drinking, like, King, t- let me add this one. Are we, j- like, because me and King just looked, like, glum as you were talking <laughs> about the, the future of Yuki. We were sitting there going, really? Um, and I was like, yeah. King, I, was, uh, I was about to jump to this. Like, how <laughs> big of a year is this for Pierre? Because you kind of get the feeling, like, he's been embedded in this team for a long time and he's made it work he is a grand prix winner now well, maybe not this specific ever... team for a long time yeah yeah but what is peter gasly's future is he going to be a franchise driver for alpatori or is he going to be on the move somewhere else i i don't know mm. we're still like it it depends on what happens down the line in terms of like Red Bull on the, in the pipeline only have like what Yuri Vips, so it's not like they're not mm. really in a rush to replace anyone at, at AlphaTauri. Uh, they're not in a rush, but I'm I thinking think, more and along I think the that's lo- the good thing is that uh, Yuki doesn't necessarily have to be looking over his shoulders all the time, wondering when's Helmet Marco going to yeah. drop the axe on yeah, me. He doesn't have to. He doesn't have to start matching Gasly out of the box. He is. He has said he is perfectly content to follow Pierre Gasly's lead, and that's awesome because Pierre Gasly is an effective lead driver at this team. I think really the only thing you would be concerned about about Pierre Gasly this season is whether or not an off-season COVID test uh, is going to affect Yikes. him at the wheel. Yeah, I'd Big say. Yikes. I'd say. AlphaTauri is like one of those teams where I really have to wait until the racing to actually see where they are relative mm. to yeah. their competitors. Because the team might gel well together, but we don't really know how fast they are until they actually start racing. Well, the problem is that we can say that for every team up until our final two teams, because this field has seems to have it, it seems to have condensed even more. I was going to make the point over here, like one, I think a lot of people have been drinking the Yuki low fuel vanity run Kool Aid that we got towards the end of testing and thought, "Ooh, that kid's oh, I'm fast." I'm not even, I'm not <laughs> even looking at his fast lap. I'm looking at the the runs he was doing in the first two days before that uh, that DRS attenuated final lap. Yeah, uh, well, I'm I'm looking at it going. Yeah, I'm with King. I f- still think they're probably going to be on the lower end of the midfield because that's normally where Alpha Tari end up regressing towards yeah. in the end anyway. Yeah. What? But the driver lineup is genuinely interesting because I mean, RJ alluded to the fact that Pierre Gasly is the lead driver of Alpha Tari. Do you really want to be the lead driver of the <laughs> no. junior team? Yeah, like that's, that's, that's the thing like, I'm thinking of. That that's not is... that's not the blessing you may think it is. Like. Well, the other Cause... reason why I'm looking at it as well is that, and we'll get to this later with uh, the other energy drink team. This Honda, this Honda power unit that was supposed to be implemented for 2022 was brought forward for this year. It's good. It's damn good. It's good. Honda, it's, Honda it was bomb proof like, in testing. Throw all the best stuff at it. One last run. 
Um, yeah. I, I don't think they're going to win. I would love to see them get a couple of podiums. I think they're going to be pretty evenly matched. I wouldn't be surprised if Gasly is the better performer. And you know what? It's fine like that. Sonoda's yeah. under no pressure to perform immediately right of the box out of his rookie year, though it would be cool. I, d- I disagree. I disagree because Sergio Perez is only on a one-year contract. <sighs> I don't think... Do you think Pierre Gasly is going to get the call back up? No. No. No, absolutely not. I Helmet think Marco I think Sonoda's got a golden ticket to a Red Bull seat if he's outstanding in his rookie year. Does he want that smoke, though? I don't think he does as, as bad as he thinks he does, but you'd be a fool to turn that opportunity down. But I think, Fair enough. I think Sonoda's got a golden ticket to a Red Bull seat if he's good in, out of the box. So I think he might be under more pressure than you think, RJ. Seriously. <sighs> <sighs> Because I, uh, I don't think I, I don't think they're I don't think they're going to go back and retread old ground with Gasly for the second time. What's the yeah, point? But but again, no. is that really pressure though? It's like oh, that it's would have, like that you, would also involve you, ditching you, Perez. Yeah, it's like you might get promoted. Oh my god, I'm under so much pressure. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It's if, like if the guy who's been one of the perennial best midfielders in F1 completely shits the bed this year. You might get a promotion, <laughs> and then I, the, I, I the think pro- the I think the pressure is kind of in the middle. I, I I'm not sure on that one because it's like the problem with Sonoda is he's got a genuinely really good teammate alongside him who's done excellent work in that car before and after the Red Bull stints that he, that he had yeah. that damaged so much of his reputation. That's going to be the problem for Sonoda is that like Pierre Gasly, relatively speaking, is a roadblock in the context of that team, but. I think I, that if, if if you want one big bold hot take prediction for the end of the year, it might be that they announce a Yuki Tsunoda promotion before the end of the year. Um, then that might be about as bold as I get because I that, hate bold predictions normally. But that, uh, um, I, I, I've got to say though, uh, do you think Pierre Gasly's going anywhere after the end of this year? No. <laughs> the, the problem with F one right now is that everyone's so set in their own academies that. Unless you blow up all of your talent and have to look somewhere else, like Red Bull did, um, everyone's kind of just locked into their own their own hierarchy within their uh, respective aligned manufacturers yeah. and teams. Because yeah, like uh, looking no at going. like looking at Pierre's future, like next season, like next couple of years, he'll be at AlphaTauri. Maybe twenty twenty three, he maybe moves over to Alpine to replace Alonso, who will be out of contract and probably retire at that point, or he'll go to sports cars. Like, that's the most realistic path for Pierre Gasly. Segway! <laughs> uh, King, King, do you want to read this Nets team? I, I feel like I, I feel like you, as the expert of all things French, uh, should be this, I, yes. I don't know if I want to touch this. The next team on our list 